So, guys, do, do, have any of you heard of cryotherapy? Yeah, <laughs> sure, of course. Uh-oh. Not cryonics, but cryotherapy. This is uh, exposing your body to extreme low temperatures for therapeutic purposes. There are two basic forms. Uh, and these are these are given in spas. I think we talked about this previously. When- we did. It was a response to an email, or it was somebody had died in a yeah. cryotherapy chamber. Yeah, that girl and who, so we talked who died. About that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you either go into the whole, you go in your whole body in the chamber. It's like minus two hundred degrees Fahrenheit, which is about oh minus one twenty-five or so Celsius. Uh, or you could go in like from your neck down. So your body's in there, but your head is out. So you're still breathing normal air. Oh, does that hurt your lungs when you're inside there without your head? Well, it's very dry. It's very dry. Yeah. yeah. And you have <laughs> to breathe, obviously. The reason why we're talking about it again is because uh, many, many of our listeners emailed us to in- inform me that Joe Rogan spoke about this on a recent episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, and he specifically referenced an article that I had previously written on science-based medicine, and he was highly critical of that article. In fact, mm. he said it was poorly researched and poorly done. And then sloppy, I think he said too. Didn't sloppy. He? he used sloppy at some point. He clearly is has a very negative attitude about my take on the topic. He was interviewing a guest, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and they spoke about the two of them spoke about cryotherapy uh, for about twenty minutes or so on the show. We'll link to that episode. Here's the thing: the reason why I want to talk about it is because during that discussion, they commit a, all the typical logical fallacies that people tend to commit when they're defending a therapy against the claim that it's not science-based or not evidence-based. And so it's instructive, you know, so partly I'm just responding to his, you know, his accusations, but also I think it's just in general, uh, very productive. He starts out by doing the thing saying that I didn't do my research, right? That is so common. It's a running gag among us on the show, right, Jay? Oh, 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 the, the Alex, the Alex Akiris, the, yeah, this was, the, oh, God, I love that. Obviously, I did the research. What he didn't like was the conclusions that I came to. Uh, usually when people say they, that, like, the scientist or the skeptic didn't do their research, what he, what they mean is they're not cherry picking the studies I want them to cherry pick. Uh, or they're not focusing on the studies I want them to focus on. Which are invariably low quality ambiguous, blah, 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 right? I mean, or, not or not good, relevant, or just right. not relevant. So I was focusing on, which is I tend to do, and I said this is what I'm focusing on, the clinical evidence. The spas are making certain clinical claims for cryotherapy. So I said, okay, what's the evidence for those claims? Obviously, the clinical evidence. Those claims are that it can speed recovery from exercise, that it can treat arthritis, reduce the symptoms of arthritis, and then it can help healing from an injury. Uh, and then the crazy ones will say everything, like it cures cancer, right? But even if we dismiss the, the crazy end of the spectrum and we take the more plausible ones, it helps with arthritis, with musculoskeletal symptoms, helps exercise recovery, helps uh, injury recovery. So it's okay, what's the evidence for those things? There have been a number of studies, uh, and fortunately there are several systematic reviews, which is always helpful. It makes it very easy. Someone's done all the busy work of tracking down all of the clinical studies and summarizing it. Uh, I also look to see if there's any been any studies since those uh, systematic reviews. And then, you know, I, you know, again, I wrote about it this week responding to Joe Rogan. I updated my research. So here's the bottom line. Uh, if you break it down to those the, the more plausible and more common claims there, uh, this systematic review looking at cryotherapy for uh, recovery from exercise. Uh, 2015 Cochrane Systematic Review basically said that the uh, insufficient evidence and that this requires more research. They updated the review in 2016. They actually got more negative in their conclusion. This is their conclusion in two, so two, 2016. This is like hot off the presses. In summary, the body of evidence in this review does not support the hypothesis that whole body cryotherapy effectively reduces muscle soreness or, and or improves subjective recovery after exercise in physically active young men. There is no evidence of its use in women or elite athletes. It's also important to note that the lack of evidence on adverse events means that one cannot be confident this, that this exposure to extreme cold air in either the short or long term is without potential harms. So we don't have safety data. The, the clinical data for doesn't show effectiveness, and it's, but it's fairly limited. Now, I'm not saying this is the bottom line, or this is the, the final word. Rather, this is 
The evidence so far is preliminary. Most of the studies are of low methodological rigor. They tend to be mixed, but you know they're meaning some positive, some negative, but nowhere near the threshold where we would say there's you know sufficient clinical evidence of effectiveness. For arthritis, the evidence is actually a little bit better, but still very preliminary. A 2014 systematic review found that they they concluded cryotherapy should be included in rheumatoid arthritis therapeutic strategies as an adjunct therapy, meaning in addition to proven therapies. Uh, However, techniques and protocols should be more precisely defined in randomized controls trials with stronger methodology. In other words, the evidence is preliminary but encouraging. We need to do actually rigorous trials to, to know. There's only six studies included in that, so that's not very much. Uh, there was a, there was a 2015 study published since that systematic review. However, they found that this was a traditional rehabilitation versus you know adding whole body cryotherapy. They found no difference between the two groups. And then another 2015 study was a double blind placebo controlled design, and they used sham cryotherapy where they you know the subjects went into a chamber that was at minus five degrees celsius so that it was very cold but just wasn't as cold as the the full whole body cryotherapy the treatment group there had minus 67 degrees celsius and they found no difference uh so this so the evidence there is looking for for arthritis is still not nearly enough to conclude that it works you know uh, some of the evidence is negative uh, it's preliminary at best. Now, what Rogan and Patrick did is that they again they did the typical things that apologists for therapies that are not yet proven do. Uh, in addition to saying that, well, you're not looking at the right research. They mainly focused on basic science research. Basic science research showing that all oh, stuff happens when you're exposed to colds, right? Uh, your your histamine levels go down and your other inflammatory markers go down and collagen goes up or whatever it's like all right that's all fine i'm not i never said it's not plausible or that it i never even said it doesn't work i didn't say either of those things all i said is you can't extrapolate from basic science research to make clinical claims you just can't do that and and that's not my rule that's that's science right that's generally accepted the reason for that you know we have a long history of trying to do just that of making clinical claims based upon or clinical hypotheses based upon what we see happening at a basic science level. Uh, and you can't, you just can't do it. The body's way too complicated. There are all kinds of reasons why something interesting happening uh, in animal research or in a Petri dish or just when you're looking at biomarkers, why that won't necessarily simplistically translate to a clinical benefit. One is that it's interacting with a whole bunch of other stuff in the body. So you don't know what the net effect is. You always have to see what the net effect is. There could be compensatory mechanisms. Uh, The magnitude of the effect could be negligible, could be true, but insignificant clinically. So unless the only way to know if those factors are, are applicable or not is to do clinical studies. You have to do the clinical research. That And only then do you know it. Most of the, the hypotheses that we generate from even very plausible, very compelling sounding basic science, most of them don't work. Most of them do not pan out. Yeah, you know, the, did you guys see the Frontline episode uh, recently, maybe a month or two ago, about supplements? I think that they illustrated this really well yeah. because they talked about how a lot of the fundamental ideas behind supplements come from sound basic research, yeah. that this kind of compound has this kind of effect. But once you put it in a pill and you swallow it, does it still do what it did in a Petri dish or what it did in a mouse? And it seems like the outcome, at least with the vast majority of supplements, is no. Yeah, with the vast majority. That's right. Mm-hmm. Then Dr. Patrick you know, did an amazing thing. She said, oh, like, you don't need double-blind placebo-controlled trials to know if these things work or not. And so how are you going to do, how are you going to double-blind exposure to cold? People know if they're being exposed to cold or not. So clearly, she was not familiar with the clinical research because, as I said, there was a study that did just that, that did sham cryotherapy with cold but not that cold exposure. You could have essentially look for a dose response curve. Does it does it matter what temperature you put it at? You know, because does it really feel that different if you're in like negative ten than if you're in negative fifty? Like, do you think we ha- we must have a threshold where it just all feels yeah, it's cold. damn cold, right? And you, yeah, may not, exactly. you may not be able to tell the difference. And they don't know what the therapeutic target is. They don't know what the 
if they're getting if that temperature that they're being exposed to is supposed to have a treatment effect or not. Right. So that's a pretty reasonable control. It may not be perfect, but that's at least better than no control at all. And, you know, the one study where they tried to control with sham uh, cryotherapy that showed no difference between the, the treatment and the sham. So this is how clinical trials evolve. Right. People figure things out like how are we going to control for this? Even if it's impossible to control for something, that doesn't mean that your uncontrolled data is magically valid. Right. All your that's just special pleading. All you're saying is why you don't have good data. That doesn't make the bad data that you have more reliable. It just means we can't really know. But in this case, I don't even buy it. I think she's wrong. I think she's the logic's invalid and she's factually incorrect because you can have sham cryotherapy. It's it's already been done. So that was an incredibly naive statement on her part. Uh, and again, she sounds like a basic scientist who has no idea about clinical research which I've encountered many times before. You know, that's that's typical. Again, I don't pretend to be an expert in basic science research, and they shouldn't pretend to be experts in clinical research. What's interesting is that Rogan said, I didn't do my research, but he did not contradict anything that I said. He didn't say, here is clinical research that shows that he's wrong. Here is clinical research that Dr. Novella ignored. All he said was anecdotes, basic science, and closed-minded that was the, basically the claims. It has nothing to do with be open or closed-minded. You can't extrapolate from basic science. Anecdotes are completely unreliable. We know that. Uh, the only real way to know if this works or not is with the clinical research, and the clinical research is nowhere even close to the threshold of being able to conclude that this is a safe and effective treatment for any of the things for which it's being used. It may, it may turn out to be effective. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm not saying it's implausible, just that it's not currently proven. So that's really kind of the takeaway that you got from looking through all of the research is that it may work, it may not, but there's just not enough evidence to support the idea that it has a significant effect for yeah. you to be satisfied enough to like walk into a cryotherapy chamber. Uh, you know, I'm a physician. My threshold is, am I going to tell my patients to do this, right? Am I yeah. going to prescribe it to my patients? No way. This is nowhere near that. We don't even know that it's safe. Uh, we don't know that it's worth the money. It's interesting. I, I think about like, quote, spa treatments, yeah. right? Because talking about this as a spa treatment or talking about this as a physical therapy treatment, those are two completely different uses. Obviously, I would think that if I had some sort of a horrible accident and then I was going to get physical therapy, I would expect that the physicians who are in charge right. would be using these kinds of stringent cutoffs. If I go to a spa, and we've talked about this before, this idea of like spa acupressure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> things like that. It's like whatever. reflexology. Exactly, <laughs> reflexology. So I just went to a spa earlier today because it's been a crazy week in New York and I had some time before I could check into my hotel. And I got a great foot massage and ah. I got a really good massage. Heaven. And of course, it was, you know, an Asian foot massage place. And so it, they called it reflexology. And I'm sure that they were claiming that the toxins were being sucked out of my feet or that rubbing this one part of my foot, I don't know, like made my eyes feel better. But the truth of the matter is, it feels good. And it makes me wonder sometimes, is there evidence, for example, that therapeutic massage, you know, that having a Swedish massage has a positive benefit? Or is it one of those things where the anecdote is enough for me to pay $100 just to feel good after? Yeah, I've written about that too. The idea that essentially mm. people are repackaging certain very basic things like relaxation and massage yeah, right, and exercise, you know, and they're repackaging it with woo, with the surrounding woo. Exactly. And it's like, yeah, that's, a, you know, massages feel good and they're relaxing and you know, that's fine. And I have no problem with getting a massage because it feels good and you can relax. When you throw the term therapeutic on top of it, though, or and then you start to attach specific claims like detox or whatever, you're crossing a line. Hmm. And it's all for marketing. It's all bullshit. It's not none of it is evidence based. You know, you get to the question I think that you're getting to is what's the harm of that? It's like, well, you know, that's uh, it's a relative thing. I think that endorsing pseudoscience does have downstream harm. Yeah, it's one of those things where I see people writing in. I don't know. I don't know if you could say that this is analogous, but it's funny when I see people writing in and they say, oh, my favorite brand of pickles now says that it's non-GMO. I, I don't even want to buy it anymore. I know. But it's I know. like, but I really like those pickles. What do I do? And I struggle with, with that. Yeah. yeah, it's like I struggle with that because 
it, it is pseudoscience, but I don't actually believe that any of the claims they're making are true. It just feels good, which is why I'm willing to pay for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, then, and you know, but the problem I have is that now you're, in, you're lending your money to that marketing strategy and you're reinforcing it. But it's hard. It's hard to find pseudoscience-free stuff in certain contexts, you know? Like, oh, totally. Try see, to find yoga, a pseudoscience-free massage. I dare you. you know? It's Exactly. But yeah. I still want my massage. Or we, I used to actually have a friend who did yoga and we called it atheist yoga because it was so rare yeah, to find somebody exactly. who would teach a yoga class and not talk about your chakras opening up. But right. I'm like, I know yoga feels good. I, I know that I'm getting a really good stretch. I'm getting good exercise when I'm doing it. It does have positive benefits. It has nothing to do with my chi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you exactly. know? We and have to is, fight the power of We got to fight back. Yeah. <laughs> it's so tough to be, because you're right. It's it's almost like, where's the availability? When yeah. the grocery store is overwhelmed with things that say non-GMO for marketing purposes and you can't get the non-non-GMO version. It sucks. It sucks. I agree. One last thing before we move on, because uh, a lot, everyone pretty much is emailing us saying, oh, it'd be great if Steve Novella could be on the Joe Rogan show or he could be on our show. So I have to say, and I usually don't do this, but he called me out on his show, so I think it's all fair game now, is we reached out to Joe Rogan and we I also invited him onto the SGU to talk about this, to have a nice polite conversation about it, and he declined. So he is the one who's refusing to talk about this with me. And which is, you know, interpret that as you will. But we don't don't ask me to invite him on the show. I've already done that. Well, Steve, you forgot the most important point. What's that, Jay? This is all Kara's fault. It is all Kara's <laughs> <laughs> Kara, we can edit that out if you want. No, I don't care. It's funny though. It's you know, it is it's funny too. I think it actually opens up an important conversation, which is finding yourself sometimes in the middle of it. Everybody can relate to this. I know that all of the rogues right now can relate to it. And I know that everybody listening can relate to this. I famously um, have an ex-boyfriend and sometimes I talk about it, sometimes I don't. But you can Google my name and see that I dated Bill Maher, who I care about immensely and we have very good relationship. But he advocates for a lot of anti-science and a lot of woo that really affects me deeply. And that was an actual issue in our relationship. And it's difficult sometimes when you find yourself in a position where you're like, well, I'm not going to only surround myself with people who think exactly like I do. And I'm not going to only be friends with people if they have the same skeptical bar as I do. But these people have these beliefs or these sacred cows or even these differences in understanding or opinion. And I still immensely respect them. I still immensely care for them. But there are those certain conversations that are just sometimes contentious regardless of mm -hmm. how much you try to approach them in like a calm and rational way people get emotional emotional about things that they're passionate about yeah it's odd though though getting emotional about cryotherapy because you don't agree with what the literature says it's like it's not even that he's disagreeing with me i'm just echoing i mean these are you know experts and researchers who did a systematic review i'm just reading their conclusion I didn't yeah. do the systematic review. They did. I'm just reading their conclusion. That's and I it. Mean, I, I think I was speaking more specifically about Bill yeah. <laughs> and, and some but, of the science stuff. But, but even, you know, and different types of emotion, you know, can be uh, interpreted different ways. But it's true, you know, anytime that somebody talks about something passionately or they advocate for something, whether they have a financial interest in it or not, just having a passionate um, interest in it. When you push back against that a little bit, it is uh, it is quite rare and quite refreshing when somebody does have no emotion yeah. in their response because it's it, that's the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Unfortunately, I agree. 